Tonight, breaking news out of Washington. The unprecedented move from the White House with gas prices at an all-time high. President Biden announcing he will release one million barrels of oil every day for the next six months, tapping into the National Oil Reserve on a scale that has never been seen before. The record-shattering plan intended to drive down prices at the pump. What it could mean for your wallet. Also breaking tonight, the deadly middle school shooting. A 12-year-old opening fire outside of a 7th grade classroom killing a student who was his own age where authorities found the young suspect hiding path of destruction nearly 30 tornadoes touching down across seven states two people killed the massive cleanup now underway as the fast-moving storm barrels up the east coast heavy rains and damaging winds expected from the carolinas all the way to new york city Critical Chernobyl danger, the major setback for Russian troops abandoning their post at Chernobyl after being exposed to, quote, significant doses of radiation. Putin striking Kiev again after U.S. intel revealed his inner circle is lying to him about how the war is going. Plus, Petito versus Laundry, the latest twist in the Gabby Petito murder case. The YouTuber killed by her fiance, Brian Laundry, during a cross country road trip. Laundry's parents now fighting to dismiss a lawsuit filed against them looking for answers. Their lawyer joining Top Story, his message to the Petito family tonight. And warrior and chef, the Army bomb tech severely injured fighting overseas. How he turned his personal tragedy into something sweet. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. Get ready to pay less, but how much exactly? We begin Top Story tonight with a major step from President Joe Biden as he tries to drive down skyrocketing prices at the pump. Biden facing growing pressure over rising energy costs, announcing today the U.S. will release one million barrels of oil every day for the next six months. This release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the biggest ever, Biden citing the war in Ukraine and its effect on the oil supply for the skyrocketing prices, saying our prices are rising because of Putin's actions. Gas prices at a record high, an average gallon costing just $2.87 last year, now ticking up above $4.20. The president keenly aware of how those prices could affect his approval rating heading into the midterm elections. But just how much will this move cut costs? NBC's Priscilla Thompson leads us off. Tonight, soaring gas prices leading President Biden to take drastic measures. Tapping into the U.S. Reserve again, announcing plans to release a million barrels of oil every day for the next six months. Your family budgets to fill a tank, none of it should hinge on whether a dictator declares war. The move marks the largest release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in history. The previous record set in November when Biden released 50 million barrels. This latest release comes just weeks after the president banned imports of Russian oil, gas and coal due to the war in Ukraine. We will not be part of subsidizing Putin's war. Now, regular unleaded gas is averaging more than $4.20 a gallon, up more than 60 cents from just a month ago. It's horrible. I'm not even filling my car up anymore. Like many Americans, Isaiah Lahone is feeling the squeeze. He commutes two hours from New Jersey to New York every day to sell sneakers in the city. I got to make an extra, an extra $100 just for gas. As the weather warms up, he's considering trading in his car for a bike until prices cool down. You got to carry everything with you on a bike, but it's, 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 it's like you rather work harder or pay more money. Even with the influx of oil, experts say the pain at the pump may not be going away anytime soon. We're not talking about weeks. We're probably talking months. Realistically, how big of an impact is this going to have? Unfortunately, in the near term, not a lot. The latest NBC News poll finds Americans' top concern is the cost of living, jumping up from fourth place in January. About 38 percent of Americans blame the president for the rising costs. Instead of just arguing about who's to blame for it, we decided to uh, take immediate action. Some states are taking matters into their own hands. Maryland, Georgia and Connecticut suspending gas taxes with at least a dozen other states considering a similar move. California, which has seen some of the nation's highest gas prices, is also considering a $400 rebate per car to help offset the rising cost. The oil release could free up as much as 180 million barrels of oil, but that's only part of Biden's plan. He's also hoping to increase U.S. oil production by urging Congress to 
to make companies pay fees on unused wells on federal lands. I'm calling for a use it or lose it policy. Still, questions remain about whether any of that will be enough and just how long Americans can afford to wait. All right, Priscilla Thompson joins us now live tonight from Manhattan, a gas station there. So Priscilla, bottom line, how much can Americans expect to save and, and when do you think they'll actually start feeling it? Yeah, Tom, it's a complicated question. The expert I spoke to said that if the oil reserve release was the only factor, it could be uh, six to eight weeks when people would begin to see some changes. But because there are global factors here, including whether other countries are going to remain so reliant on Russian oil or if they will move to find other sources, there are a lot of factors at play here. And so bottom line, the expert I spoke to said that folks likely won't see the prices drop at the pump, but they will likely not get higher because of this oil oil reserve release. Tom? And again, they are at historical highs. All right, Priscilla, we thank you for that. We're also following breaking news out of South Carolina, where a 12-year-old is dead after a shooting at a middle school. Authorities say a classmate the same age opened fire outside of the classroom in Greenville. The, little, the young suspect was found hiding under the deck of a house nearby. The Greenville County Sheriff's Office says he's being charged with murder. Other students at the school were evacuated to a nearby church. No other injuries have been reported. And tonight we're also tracking the path of destruction from all those tornadoes. That severe weather sweeping up the East Coast after pounding the South. Those storms turning deadly in Florida, killing two. And in Mississippi and Alabama, a tornado outbreak damaging homes, uprooting trees, and downing power lines. Blaine Alexander on the destruction left behind. It's the alarm sounding in cities across the South. You have no time left. You need to be in your safe place. A massive, fast-moving storm system producing more than 400 weather warnings across at least 16 states, with more than two dozen reported tornadoes. It vibrated the house. I just kept reassuring my family, we're going to be okay, we're okay, we're okay. Officials say the storm claimed two lives in the Florida panhandle and sent winds whipping through Alabama and Mississippi, destroying Teresa Love's new home before she could even move in. It's devastating. It was going to be a home for me and my kids. And in parts of Louisiana, still reeling from last week's tornado outbreak, another direct hit. This twisted pile of metal is what's left of the roof here at Tallulah Academy in eastern Louisiana. Typically, this building would have been full of K through 12 students. Fortunately, officials canceled classes before the storm blew through. One, two, Bettina Finlayson three, made that call. Five, got I needed to keep my baby safe, and I told him, I said, I've got to shut this school down. Now, millions along the East Coast are feeling the storm's impact, the final stop in what's been an unforgiving path. Tom, 57 million people in the storm's path today. Those are risks from Florida all the way up to New York. It also means a massive job for officials with the National Weather Service. They fanned out today across seven states, surveying the damage to take stock of exactly what happened when those storms blew through. Tom. All right, we thank Blaine for that. For more on the storm's march to the east, I want to bring in Al Roker with the latest. Al, it's getting pretty wet and ugly out there where we are. What's it going to look like for the rest of the night? Well, it's going to be a little hairy for a little while, Tom, but then we're going to watch as this, in fact, you can see the front really right along the coast. Heavy rain right now down through Florida, but here's where the tornado watches are stretching from the South Carolinas all the way up, just including Richmond, Virginia, to the south of Washington, but from Washington to the north, Binghamton, New York, York, New York City, Philadelphia, we are in severe thunderstorm watches. And in fact, talk about severe weather right now. 51 million people are at risk for strong wind gusts. That's what we're most worried about, strong wind gusts, 70 miles per hour in this enhanced area just west of New York into Harrisburg, Washington, D.C., tornadoes possible, and we're also looking for a damaging hail. There will be rain, but not as much as one would expect. This system pushes off through the northeast tonight. The front will exit the coast by Friday morning. We're going to be looking at colder air coming in around the Great Lakes, some wraparound snow shower through interior uh, parts of Pennsylvania, west Western New York, rainfall amounts a quarter of an inch to a half an inch. So the rain's not the big problem, Tom. It's going to be the winds, and then things die down, and finally, a quiet day into the weekend. All right, Al, we hope for that. Thank you so much. We also want to turn now to the war in Ukraine. Six weeks in, and Russia is continuing attacks on key cities, including a new strike on Kyiv. But tonight, Russian forces have handed Ukraine back control of the Chernobyl power plant, and there are new concerns over radiation poisoning. Richard Engel is in Ukraine. Russia's military has suffered shocking setbacks in Ukraine, some 
self-inflicted. But today may be one of the biggest yet. Ukraine's state nuclear company says two columns of Russian troops left the Chernobyl nuclear disaster site, still contaminated from the 1986 meltdown. The company said the Russians are leaving after digging trenches in the contaminated soil and receiving significant doses of radiation. The Russian military has said radiation levels have remained within a normal range in the area. But is Putin even being told? A day after the White House said Russian generals were afraid to give Putin the truth about the war. President Biden saying this today. How badly is Vladimir Putin being misinformed by his advisors? That's an open question. He seems to be self-isolating. And tonight, a U.S. official tells NBC News the United States has assessed some Russian government senior officials likely disagreed with Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. Despite promises to reduce attacks around Kyiv, Russia is already striking again near the capital, destroying this warehouse. Ukraine's President Zelensky, who spoke with President Biden late yesterday, says he needs more American help to defend his country, including fighter jets and tanks. U.S. aid is essential for us, he said, while President Putin is making new economic threats, saying unfriendly countries, which include Europe and the United States, must pay for Russian natural gas in rubles in Russian banks by tomorrow or risk being cut off. Tom, the sale of oil and gas is a critical source of hard currency for Russia, and Europe is far more dependent on it than the United States, which recently banned it. Tonight, Germany's economy minister said that Russia could not divide Europe and that Western allies would not be blackmailed. Tom? Richard Engel again for us tonight. Richard, thank you for that. Back here at home, a major headline we're following out of Washington and a problem that will not go away for President Biden. There are growing signs that the federal investigation into President Biden's son, Hunter, is broader than we first knew. This as Republicans in Congress are turning up the pressure as well. NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams has the details. People familiar with the federal investigation of Hunter Biden, which he himself disclosed a year and a half ago, say it's broader now than he at first described it with a growing number of witnesses called before a grand jury. It began as an examination of whether he paid all the taxes he should have on income from his work for foreign companies, including Burisma Holdings, a Ukrainian energy company. This email from a former business partner, for example, found on a laptop computer Biden used, said he failed to disclose $400,000 that he was paid by the Ukrainian company. That laptop, which he took to a Delaware shop to get repaired but never reclaimed, was seized by the FBI, but not before Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani got a copy of its hard drive, which he shared with congressional Republicans. Documents they've made public show that accounts linked to Biden also received nearly $4 million in consulting contracts from a Chinese energy company, according to an analysis by The Washington Post. But during the campaign, then-candidate Biden denied there was a China connection. My son has not made money in terms of this thing about, uh, what are you talking about, China. Senate Republicans say the documents also show Hunter Biden signed an agreement to represent an official of that company, Patrick Ho, for a million dollars. Ho was later convicted in a U.S. court of trying to bribe government officials in Africa. The Republicans say that shows Hunter Biden had close ties to the Chinese government. Hunter Biden was financially connected to CEFC, a company that was an arm of the communist Chinese regime. Now, according to people familiar with the investigation, it has broadened out to look at whether he violated federal lobbying disclosure laws. This investigation is being run by the U.S. attorney in Delaware, a holdover from the Trump administration, and officials say it's a long way from over. Tom? Pete Williams with that update tonight. Pete, thank you for that. In other legal news, there is a new lawsuit involving the family of Gabby Petito. Her family accusing the parents of Brian Laundrie of trying to help their son flee after he killed Gabby. Laundrie's parents now asking a judge to throw that lawsuit out. You'll hear from their lawyer in a moment right here on Top Story. But first, we go to Issa Gutierrez with the latest on this legal battle. Tonight, the saga of Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie that captivated the nation and ended in tragedy is actually far from over. Stretching, doing some morning yoga. Their families now intertwined in a legal battle. 
Laundry's parents motioning Wednesday to dismiss a civil lawsuit filed by Gabby's parents earlier this month in Florida that alleged the Laundries knew their son Brian killed Gabby and hindered the search for her body. They're essentially saying with this motion, hey court, let's assume everything the plaintiff says in the complaint is true. They still don't have a case. The civil suit that Gabby's parents filed in Sarasota County, Florida, where the Laundries live, says potential damages would exceed $30,000. The motion to dismiss the civil suit says the Laundries had, quote, fundamental constitutional rights to silence and a general constitutional right to not speak on any topic in the face of a criminal investigation. It's an easy argument to make that what the Laundries did was morally extreme and outrageous, but legally it may not be there. We reached out to the Petito family lawyer and did not hear back. Hello, hello, and good morning. Gabby Petito's disappearance captured the attention of the nation last year. She'd been on a road trip with her fiancé, Brian Laundrie, before she went missing, posting images and videos along the way. But some moments were less idyllic. How are you doing? Good. Hey, we got a call about a male hitting a female and the two of them getting in this vehicle and taking off. Well, to be honest, I definitely hit him first. In early September, Laundry returned to Florida alone where his parents lived and saw them before he disappeared. Petito was reported missing later that month, and then authorities found Petito's body in Wyoming. Her death was ruled as a homicide. A month later, Laundry's body was discovered in Florida, officials saying he shot and killed himself, and left notes behind saying he was responsible for Petito's death. The Laundry's lawyer sat down with Tom Yamas on Top Story in October, the day officials confirmed Laundry's remains. Did your clients know their son, Brian Laundry, was going to disappear when he left the house that day? No, they did not. What I can tell you is that Brian was very upset when he left. We've never heard from the Laundry's, and there's a reason for that, correct? Absolutely. And I've said several times, I, I said it over a month ago, the reason you haven't heard from the laundries is because I told them not to talk to anybody. Do you think that there is any chance that this lawsuit from the Petitos moves forward? This complaint is already hanging on by a thread. All right, Issa Gutierrez joins us now live in studio. Okay, we always respect Danny's legal analysis, but if he's wrong and this does move forward, what does this mean for the laundries? Well, Tom, if it isn't dismissed, the case will move forward into discovery. Now, what that means at that point is that the defendants, the laundries, will have to answer questions under oath about what they knew and when they knew it. So if the laundries have been holding any information back at that point in that potential next step, that would come to light whether they wanted to or not. Issa Gutierrez with a lot of new reporting tonight for us. Issa, thank you for that. For more on this lawsuit and the ongoing battle between the Petitos and the Laundries, I want to bring in the attorney for the Laundry family, Steve Bertolino, right now. He joins me now on Top Story. So, Steve, we know it's their constitutional right, but why haven't your clients spoken out since the death of their son in an attempt to get set the record straight? Yes, good evening, Tom. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, as you know, the FBI case is still open. The FBI has not closed this case. And, you know, my clients were the subject of uh, part of that criminal investigation. It's still uh, within their purview to remain silent, and that's what we've advised them to do. You know, in that point in the motion, you said the complaint from Gabby Petito's family is insufficient and deficient. What do you think the holes are in the case? Well, the, the holes are there's basically no case law that we can find that requires anyone to speak under any circumstances. Uh, indeed, part of the First Amendment, uh, as it's been interpreted, uh, not only gives you the right to speak, but it gives you the right not to speak. And that's in, in any given situation. When you apply it more to the criminal side and you look at the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, uh, why should we have to speak? So if the basis of this lawsuit is that Chris and Roberta chose not to communicate and not to speak, which is your right, my right, and their right, there's no basis for the claim based upon that theory. Let's go back to, to you saying the media considers you and your clients the bad guys. Steve, if it was your daughter, wouldn't you think the laundry's behavior was a little suspicious during this time? Their son's girlfriend was missing. He was the last one to see her. At what point don't you start questioning your son? You know, Tom, that, that's a fair question, and I've been asked that question because I do have uh, two daughters, three if you count my daughter-in-law. 
Uh, when all said and done, that's not my role here. My role is as an attorney for the Laundry family, which included Brian, Chris, and Roberta. So my perspective has to be very different than that of a, of a father. And I, I don't know your history. If you're a dad or the dads and moms that are watching, of course it's heart-wrenching. Of course it's a terrible tragedy. It's a terrible thing for either side to have to go through. But my role in this in, in specifically was to advise my clients to remain silent. They followed that advice. It was their constitutional right to do so. And now they're faced with civil liability for simply exercising the right that's afforded them. And it's a fundamental tenant upon which our, our, our society is based. As you mentioned, the FBI investigation remains open. How would you describe their communications with law enforcement throughout this process? Who do you mean by there? Uh, your, your clients. My clients had virtually no communication with law enforcement other than the few times when um, law enforcement, FBI, and local Northport PD had to come to the laundry home on that Friday evening to uh, take uh, a report for Brian being missing. Uh, another time when Chris went to the preserve with uh, certain officers to help with the search. Uh, another time when Chris and Roberta were accompanied by law enforcement, uh, law enforcement when they found uh, Brian's remains. Other than that, post Brian being uh, located or his remains being located, we've uh, been very cooperative with law enforcement with all aspects that we need to be. Yeah, again, Steve, though, if, if they did nothing wrong, why not just a phone call, an email, anything to say, hey, I'm sorry this happened? You know, you, you can you say Monday morning quarterback, and you can look back as some people have questions, said, you know, do Chris and Roberta wish they had done things differently? In fact, uh, some FBI agents posed that question to me directly here in my office. And I can look at you and, and so can Chris and Roberta and tell you, we would not have changed the thing that we did. There are reasons that are unknown to the public for everything we did. Maybe someday Chris and Roberta will want that story to be told. But as of right now, the answer is no. We're focusing on defending this baseless lawsuit. And, you know, hopefully the courts agree with us. We're confident that, uh, you know, if we have to go to a different level of court, we will. But we're hopefully that this case gets dismissed at the trial court level where it should be dismissed. Finally, Steve, do you think this lawsuit is about justice or do you think it's about money? Honestly, I don't think it's about either. I, I don't, I, you know, listen, I'm not happy the lawsuit was filed, uh, but I don't think the Petitos are looking for money here. I think they want answers. Uh, and I think they want to punish in some way Chris and Roberta. I think they want to see Chris and Roberta suffer. Um, as, as Mr. Stafford said in his letter, we want to hold them accountable. You know what? Let it go. You have two families that suffered the tragic loss of a young child. The Petitos should look beyond it and let it go. Maybe at some point, without the threat of liability, a story can be told that would give some answers to the Petitos that they want. But focusing again on the claims set forth in this lawsuit, they're baseless. It shouldn't have been filed. And we're, we're hopeful and we're confident that it will be dismissed. Probably incredibly hard to let it go when you lose a child, as you can imagine, as a parent and, and a parent myself. Um, I, I do actually well, have Tom, one question. Tom, let's, not yeah. forget that, let's not forget that Chris and Roberta lost a child here, too. And, and as you keep setting forth, yeah. they did nothing wrong. They did nothing wrong and they lost a child as well. Yeah. So how about we let them, you know... Right, 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 right. But some people may hear you, Stephen. They may think that 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 that's being, you know, a little insensitive just to let it go. It's got to be incredibly hard for for both these families. I agree with you. But I, I do ask, want to ask you one question. You knew Brian Laundrie personally. That's actually how you became the family attorney. Did you ever think he was capable of something like this? No, absolutely not. And you know, my relationship with Brian was very different. I'm an adult, and he was a child. I knew him when he played with my children on on the street. With, with all that being said. You know, you never really know somebody. And, and indeed, you know, there's been a lot of speculation about uh, both uh, Brian Laundrie and Gabby Petito. In the end, you know, Brian was not a, a domestic violence abuser. Uh, this was a tragedy that, that occurred. There's no doubt about it. Brian has taken, uh, allegedly, or according to the FBI, he has taken some responsibility for, for Gabby Petito's death. Uh, and that is what it is. We'll all have to uh, live with that and accept it. Steve Bertolino, thank you for joining Top Story tonight.
We turn now to another cold case that's been solved. A 30-year-old woman murdered in her home over three decades ago. Tonight, police say they found her killer thanks to the detective work of college students. NBC's Zinclay Esamwa has that story. Tonight, a 35-year cold case. Police unable to make a break is finally closed with the help of college students. Meet one of them. We could just let the detectives know, like, hey, there's this piece of information that you guys might want to look back into, or there's more that could be done with this. And there was more to be done. Western Michigan University students teaming up with Michigan State Police and genealogists, all to find out who killed Roxanne Wood. Just 30 years old when she was found dead on February 20th, 1987. Police say her murderer slashing her throat and stabbing her to death in her Michigan home. For over three decades, Wood's murder remained a mystery. Why was this case so difficult to solve? For one reason, we believe it was totally random. Lieutenant Christensen saying limitations in DNA technology and staffing made solving the case a challenge. That's where the WMU cold case program came in. We started off with um, multiple, multiple boxes of information of all of the evidence that the police have already um, located. Some of that evidence unidentified DNA from the original crime scene. Our approach is taking that sample and creating the genetic profile for this unknown DNA contributor. Vargas, the investigative genetic genealogist on the case, used that DNA to search sites like GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA and found potential matches. By building out those family trees is how we're able to make the connection and I ultimately identify who the subject is. Ultimately linking the murder to 67 year old Patrick Gillum, police collecting a cigarette outside Gillum's Indiana home for DNA, confirming his connection. Gillum arrested nearly 35 years to the date of Woods killing. He pleaded no contest to a charge of second degree murder, now clearing the name of Woods husband, Terry Wood, a longtime person of interest in the case. You can imagine the amount of pressure that he had been under for years. The family was my motivation. They never gave up. And clearing the way for more Western Michigan University cold case program wins. I'm sure we won't be this successful every time, but um, how cool it is. I think that the state police are trusting these students. You know, the work they did is, is simply incredible. Zinclay joins us now from here in 30 Rock Live tonight. Zinclay, you, you mentioned there in the piece, uh, Wood's husband, he was finally cleared. Have we heard from him since this case was solved? Yeah, Tom. So we spoke with Terry Wood today, actually, and he wanted to thank the students who helped solve the case. The lieutenant actually highlighted that in his conversations with Terry after the charges, her husband really has been in shock just processing it all. I mean, Tom, it's been 35 years, which is a long time, but it seems he's on the other side now. He actually says he attended Western Michigan University himself and said, go Broncos to the students. So a lighter sentiment amid the heavy story. But I should add, we did reach out to the person we think is Gillum's attorney and have not yet heard back. Tom. All right, Zinclay Esamwa, thank you for that. When we come back, a major change for U.S. passports. The State Department announcing it will add a third gender option to passport applications when it's set to go into effect. We'll explain. Stay with us. All right, back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with a series of explosions rocking a small California city. A massive fire ripping through a facility containing compressed gas cylinders, causing them to detonate. The building blown to pieces with debris flying up to 700 feet away and even damaging a car. Four people injured and nearby schools placed on lockdown just out of caution. The cause of this fire is still under investigation. All right, U.S. citizens will be able to select the gender-neutral X on passports starting April 11th. The State Department announced in June it would add the third gender marker, but did not say when. TSA also said the option will be included in the agency's pre-check application, both announcements coming on the eve of Transgender Day of Visibility. And the U.S. men's soccer team is heading to the World Cup for the first time in eight years. 
The team secured a spot despite a 2-0 loss to Costa Rica on the final night of qualifying. Costa Rica had to win by at least six to overtake Team USA in the standings. The 2022 World Cup will be held in Qatar and is set to begin on November 21st. All right, we want to turn now to an NBC News exclusive as foreign threats to American assets expand the traditional battlefield. A new branch of armed forces prepares to take to the interstellar front lines. NBC's Tom Costello once again takes us inside Space Force to look at the recruiting. Pick up heading 270 detonator, Chinese dragon. Those two are engaging on the target. In a dark simulator room at the Air Force Academy. Following good hits, dead man. America's next generation of fighter pilots is in the cockpit. Ambush one. But these future officers have a choice to make. They can stick with a career as airmen or apply to become a guardian with the brand new Space Force. So we talk about how the warfighter is impacted by the space environment. Where the focus shifts from fighter jets to satellites. Like it or not, the reality is the battlefield is changing from planet Earth to space. This is the view of the Asian Pacific Theater. And the threat matrix in space is very different. It's congested, it's contested, and it's competitive. Line down. Copy line. Our cameras were the first ever allowed inside the classified Space Force Satellite Command Center, where Space Force guardians monitor every military satellite in orbit, including the vital links to units in the field, to Air Force One, and the nuclear chain of command. While next door, the GPS Command Center watches over 37 satellites that provide free GPS coverage to the world. How accurate is the U.S. system? Within a foot and a half, guaranteed. A foot and a half? Yes, sir. Outside, under heavy guard, one of several mobile satellite command units never before photographed, ready to roll across the country should headquarters face imminent threat. The U.S. military says Russia and China are already regularly harassing, jamming, and probing U.S. commercial satellites that are critical to the U.S. economy. Satellites come in all sizes, from a school bus to a dishwasher to a cooler to the size of a loaf of bread, providing everything from Internet access to university experiments, GPS, and military communications. Both Russia and China have already targeted and blown up their own satellites, creating massive orbiting debris fields. I think they're trying to send a message that they could target somebody else's as well. And, uh, and now we have to deal with the aftermath of those, uh, those tests. Space Force was created to avoid an actual shooting war in space or on the moon. General Sean Bratton. How do you determine what is a hostile act in space? We're working through that now. We don't have that history like we do in the other domains to build upon. And so as we're encountering these, um, these threatening activities for the first time, it's forcing us to really define these terms. This is a major threat. A new threat environment for new guardians and academy cadets who are already designing and launching their own satellites. After graduating, senior Courtney Kirkpatrick will head to MIT for her master's, then Space Force. They're creating a new culture. Everything's going to be fast moving. The digital force, as they call it, um, that was really attractive to me. As for the future. As the United States builds out a lunar presence of our own, do we need uh, boots on the moon to protect those assets? Well, I think that remains to be seen. All right, Tom joins us now again on set here on Top Story. Tom, let's pick up where that general left off. I mean, are we really talking about boots on the moon? And could the U.S. even build a military outpost out there? So, no, we're not talking about boots tomorrow, but potentially in the future. Their mission is to protect U.S. assets. So if that means a NASA lunar base that they feel is threatened, or if there is a Chinese base on the moon that they feel is threatening, it is possible we could see Space Force boots on the moon someday. And I guess the follow-up question is when, when you think about the entire universe, right, the only place that we know of that there's no armed conflict right now is space. Is, is that something that, that, that could happen in the future? I mean, real Star Wars? Nobody obviously wants to see that. But one of the generals said to me, if you look at the history of men and women and exploration, wherever explorers go, conflict follows. Whether it's the Wild West, whether it's on the high seas. And the concern is that could also happen in space. Incredible stuff there. All right, Tom Costello again on Space Force for us. Tom, thank you for that. We want to head back to Ukraine tonight where every day more refugees make their way out of a war zone. 
Tonight, we're getting new harrowing accounts of their escape from the most intense fighting areas. Gabe Gutierrez is in central Ukraine with those stories. This is the heart-stopping drive out of southeastern Ukraine, as seen from the car of Olga Kachakova. How hard was the journey from Mariupol? It was horrible, she says. The city is destroyed completely. These are more images from her neighborhood, now a ghost town. This man, who asked us not to show his face, says he was with Mariupol's territorial defense. His hand shattered by what he tells us was a Russian grenade. Do you think that Mariupol might eventually fall? No, never. No, never. But he says the Russians captured his father, and he hasn't heard from him in almost two weeks. Here in Vinitsa, a humanitarian hub has sprung up. Of in all places, a mall. Organizer Anna Chernikova says it's already helped more than 2,000 refugees. When people are coming, I understand that by my heart. Mm -hmm. Because she's been through it. She fled the Donbass region after Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. I never saw my grandma again, and she's died already. Her brother was a young boy when they rushed out and the psychological toll it took still haunts her. He didn't talk for one year. So when I saw these children, I even couldn't recognize what it will be in future with this generation. Olga Lysichen came here two weeks ago from the Donbass region with 14 family members. The printing company she built from scratch was leveled. I don't know what to do, she says. Here, for so many, the future is uncertain but they're holding on. I just believe that it will be a win, a victory for Ukraine. It could, couldn't be another way. Just days ago, Ukrainian authorities say a Russian airstrike targeted the country's Air Force Command in this area. And earlier in the war, the city's civilian airport was destroyed. So authorities here are on high alert, Tom. All right, Gabe Gutierrez for us tonight. Gabe, thank you for that. Time now for Top Stories Global Watch and escalating tensions in the Middle East. A gun battle breaking out between Palestinians and Israeli forces inside of a refugee camp in the West Bank. At least two Palestinians killed and more than a dozen injured. Israel says it was raiding the camp to arrest three suspects linked to a deadly shooting attack inside the country earlier this week. A Turkish prosecutor facing backlash after he asked an Istanbul court to transfer the Jamal Khashoggi murder trial to Saudi Arabia. The, requ the request comes after Saudi Arabia refused to extradite 26 nationals connected to the 2018 assassination of the Washington Post journalist. Turkey's justice minister will now consider the transfer. Khashoggi's f a family and activist groups slamming the request, saying Saudi Arabia has already tried to cover up this case. And the raging wildfire prompting evacuations in Chile. New video shows firefighters working against strong winds to battle the fire in the southern part of the country. So far, more than 200 acres and 40 homes destroyed. Firefighters are trying to keep flames away from residential areas, with some nearby residents joining the effort to douse those flames. All right, now it's time for the Americas, a look at stories coming out of the U.S. and across Latin America. Tonight, the number of refugees traveling through the deadly region known as the Darien Gap continues to grow, in particular among Venezuelans. NBC's Guad Venegas on why so many are now being pushed to take this dangerous journey. Desperation and necessity for thousands of refugees crossing a treacherous and deadly jungle in search for a better future. For months, families have been making the journey, mothers carrying their babies, men traveling with the few belongings they could carry, walking for days across the Darien Gap. This deadly region tucked between Colombia and Panama has become a human smuggling corridor. Hundreds of thousands of people making their way from South America in hopes of making it to the U.S.-Mexico border. This week, Panamanian authorities warning the number of migrants crossing in 2022 is growing. In the first two months of this year, the number of crossings already tripling compared to the same period last year. The number of Venezuelans in particular skyrocketing. According to a new report by the U.N. Refugee Agency, more than 2,500 Venezuelans have crossed the Darien Gap in the first two months of 2022, almost reaching the entire total of those who crossed last year. It's hard to overstate how um, 
perilous this journey is. And, and it speaks to the desperation that people are feeling. Many escaping the crushing economic toll of the Maduro regime and the impact of COVID-19 now displacing those who previously settled in other countries like Colombia, Chile, and Peru. Late last year, their options to flee becoming more limited with visa requirements for travel to Mexico and most of Central America. To a certain degree, this, these sort of visa, new visa requirements really drive people to find more dangerous ways to make their journeys. Do you have any idea of where these Venezuelans are headed? But they're headed north. Um, some will, uh, you know, maybe try to uh, reach the United States. The trend is that more people are seeking, more Venezuelans are seeking asylum at the southern border of Mexico. While some choose to remain in Mexico, others are expected to reach the United States where the Biden administration has offered temporary protective status to Venezuelans in the U.S. All right, Guad Venegas joins us now live from Los Angeles tonight. Guad, this week we got reports that the U.S. is preparing to lift its COVID-19 regulations at the border come May. How would these changes affect so many who are trying to cross in? Tom, well, once Title 42 is removed, all of the ports of entry at the U.S.-Mexico border will be open for migrants from all over the world to come and seek asylum. So you look at a country like Venezuela, much of these migrants leaving Venezuela, a country under sanctions from the United States, they do have a higher probability of receiving asylum in the U.S. when they come. So this uh, removal of Title 42 uh, will motivate more migrants who have no other options to try and make their way all the way to the U.S.-Mexico border. Tom? All right, Guad Venegas first tonight. Guad, thank you for joining Top Story. Coming up, celebrating 25 years of the color of money, personal finance columnist Michelle Singletary joins Top Story. Her reflections on more than two decades of investing advice, what she learned from her grandmother, and the one tip she swears by. You'll want to hear it. Stay with us. All right, back now with Money Talks. Navigating personal finance isn't easy. And on the 25th anniversary of her column, Color of Money veteran Washington Post journalist Michelle Singletary reflected on what she's learned. And it started with a lesson from Big Mama. Michelle joins us now live. She's also the author of What to Do with Your Money When Crisis Hits, a Survival Guide. I invite everyone to read the column on the Washington Post website tonight. Michelle, first off, who is Big Mama and what did she teach you? So that was my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who took my took me and my siblings in. There was five of us. My sister was eight, I was four, my sister was three, and twin brothers just under two years old. And she raised us um, on just no more than like $13,000 a year. But she was such a master at money. I like to joke that if she held a penny, Lincoln would scream. That's incredible. And so what did she teach you, though? So, you know, one thing she taught me to despise debt, you know, um, because she just felt like that just limits your life, financial life. Um, she told me to, you know, save from every paycheck, every dollar that I uh, ever got. Um, she taught me to put it to the side for a rainy day because she said, you know what? It's always going to rain. Uh, and, you know, pay your bills on time. I mean, I, she just was such a great money manager. And I just soaked up all of her wisdom. Stuff. She instilled the fundamentals in, in you. You became a writer, a journalist. So you've been writing this column for 25 years, helping people. What's the one investing tip you swear by? So start early. You know, the sooner you start, you know, and I understand I've got young adults and they go, oh, that retirement. But I'm telling you, your old self will thank you. Um, and I just wish, you know, I had even started earlier. Um, you're doing quite well now, but if you're young and then you know what? Do it regularly. Dollar cost averaging, meaning every paycheck, every month, put some money aside for the time that you're going to not be working anymore. And same thing if you're trying to save for you to send your kids to college. College. My husband and I sent all three of our children to college debt free. They don't have loans and we don't have loans. What Just a, saving over 20 years. What a years. gift. What a gift you gave your children. You know, from reading your column, I know that Big Mama didn't trust the stock market, right? And you write that the only bond <laughs> she had was the bond adhesive for her dentures. So <laughs> how, do you, how do you see the stock market for lay investors? Because, you know, during the pandemic, so many people instantly became day traders. 
Yeah. You know, that's not investing. That's speculating. You know, sound investing, guess what? It's boring. You know, you put your money in, you wait for it, you diversify, you make sure you have some stocks and bonds. And, you know, as you get closer to retirement, you might need to rebalance. Um, and that's how you do it. That's how you build wealth. All the things that you're hearing now, invest in crypto, do all this stuff. You know, the, those people, especially like 401k millionaires, they've invested over their career. They invest as much much as 15% of their gross pay. You know, they don't leave any money on the table. They take their employer's match and they just let time do what it does, which is help build wealth for you. Compound interest, right? So powerful. That's right. Um, you said that in your first column that you ever wrote that it was for, quote, anyone else who realizes that regardless of who you are, the color of money is always the same. How do you approach readers who don't have a financial education, which I would argue are most people, especially people of color? You know, it's definitely. I mean, America's lived the American dream on debt. And so what I say is, listen, you work hard for your money. Make sure that you are building the wealth and following your priorities. So people say, how do I stay on a debt, on a budget? So for my husband and I, we knew we wanted to send our kids to school with any debt. So whenever they ask for stuff, we like, college fund. You know, mommy, can I have college fund? Three words for you, college fund. And my oldest, who got tired of that, she said, well, I got three words for you nursing home, <laughs> which is why I say for my own retirement. <laughs> but we made it part of our family goals to, to go to college, to, you know, so that, you know, pay off our home before we retire, you know, set those goals. That's where it starts. And once you set them, live by them, you know, we could say no to our kids because we knew we wanted them to graduate with debt. We could say no to ourselves because we knew we wanted to pay off our mortgage before we retire. And we wanted to have a secure retirement. And I just say, listen, I get this money stuff is really difficult. It's hard. It's complicated. But if you start with your values, your priorities, right. stay on point. Michelle Singletary, we love having you tonight on Top Story. I'm going to invite you back for more because I feel you have a lot of wisdom. And you can tell more Big Mama stories. Thank you so much. All right, up next, a wounded warrior's new calling, how an army bomb tech turned his tragedy into triumph. Stay with us. Finally tonight, he suffered the wounds of war, but eventually found a fulfilling new mission in the kitchen. Kerry Sanders has his story of sacrifice and determination. Sidestep. There you go. Sacrifice. How far would you go until you just give up? Aaron Hale, a U.S. Army bomb tech, thought losing his eyesight to an IED in Afghanistan was all he could endure. I'm 100% uh, blind. These are prosthetic eyes. Then four years later, a freak exposure to meningitis turned Aaron's dark world silent. Aaron lost all hearing. I was trapped inside my body. My, my, my whole world ended at my fingertips. It was a really sad time in our life. Michaela, a neighborhood girl Aaron had not seen since he was 21, made a surprise visit to the hospital. They improvised communications. I would just be like... H. E. Hey. Mm -hmm. And then we like just came up with this yeah. form of communicating. Eventually, thankfully, technology. I'm completely deaf except for this one cochlear implant. So when I do this, I am completely 100% deaf. You hear me now? Yes. Aaron and Michaela eventually married and had twin sons. Now a family of five, along with Aaron's firstborn from a previous marriage. Still... Aaron needed a mission. He needed something to do. You choose the word mission. That, that's like a military term. He, he needed, needed a that. mission. And he needed a purpose, a reason to get out of bed. Michaela deployed Aaron to the kitchen. Before he defused bombs, he had been a chef in the Navy, preparing meals for admirals. I'm Aaron Hale, it's good without looking. His mission on the home front went viral on TikTok, cooking without looking. Toast your cumin seeds before grinding them. Aaron's signature dish, candies. This is good. How much of this do you eat while you're working? So popular with neighbors, he launched a candy company. In military speak, Aaron was EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. 
He scrambled the letters, added and subtracted. Now he has a candy business, Extraordinary Delights. For a long time, Aaron understandably questioned life. Now, with his family by his side, he questions, is there anything a wounded vet cannot do? The lesson that he's teaching me is that never, never to give up. Happiness, success, achievement, maybe just an end to the pain is just one step beyond what you think is the most you can take. When we're ready to give up, you're saying don't? Yeah. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. Our veterans are such incredible people. We thank Kerry for that story, and we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.